It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. As human beings, we are born with a genetic code that we believe makes us who we are and guides our behavior, that we're hardwired to react in a certain way. What if this is a myth? What if we can erase and replace our internal programming and master our own code? According to today's guest, Darren Gold, our behavior is driven by a subconscious program of our own making. Our genes don't have full control of our lives. We do. Darren joins us to discuss how you can rewrite and master your code in every aspect of life. Darren advises and coaches CEO and leadership teams at many of the world's most innovative companies. He's the author of the book, Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life. Welcome, Darren. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me. So, Darren, we've been taught that our genes govern our behavior, But the emerging field of epigenetics has revealed a new truth, that our genes don't have full control of our lives. We do. What do you believe this means regarding the way we live life? Well, I think specifically with regard to epigenetics, there's an increasing amount of research and a body of knowledge suggesting that the environment plays a really critical role, Uh, that that genes operate like light switches, and that the, the environment and cues from our environment send signals that either turn those genes on or off. So there's now a sort of consensus view, I would say, emerging that um, our environment is probably the most important driver of our behavior and the the degree to which we have control over uh, our own ability to shape how we behave, who we become, you know, what we can achieve in life uh, is much greater than we may have otherwise thought. How powerful are our thoughts in this process? Uh, extremely powerful. You know, I argue the basic sort of essential thesis of the book is that we're all, that we all have a program. Uh, and I define that uh, as a set of subconscious safety-based beliefs, values, and rules that really drive your behavior, but limit your results. And so uh, the basic kind of argument is that uh, over time, particularly in childhood, we begin to form beliefs about ourselves, about others, about the world, And those beliefs, those thoughts really govern and drive our behavior at the subconscious level. We don't even recognize that it's happening and we act out of those beliefs. So if you want to have a different set of behaviors and a different set of results in life, you have to get at what I call kind of the source of action, which is the way you think and the beliefs that you hold. So you say that the average person is run by her program and doesn't even know it. The extraordinary person rewrites her program and becomes the master of her code. What are some of the beliefs of a person who is run by his or her program, who is in that subconscious mode most of the time? Yeah, I share um, an example uh, of my own, and maybe I'll do that right now just to sort of bring to life this distinction. Uh, I was eight years old when I came to the U.S. I was born in London, England, and I can tell you, you know, at age eight, having an English accent in Southern California is not very cool. <laughs> and I was, uh, I was teased mercilessly. And so in that moment, subconsciously, I didn't even know it, I constructed a belief that I had to be liked. And so this sort of need to be liked was sort of written very early on in my life without me even knowing it. And I was run by that belief. And it served me uh, in many respects. I, uh, I was, had a lot of early personal and professional success. But when I entered adulthood, I began to take on uh, more complex roles in terms of leadership. Uh, I started a family. Uh, the, this sort of program, this part of my program, this need to be liked, uh, started to really get in my way. I found it really difficult to have very direct and honest conversations. I robbed people of critical feedback that I worked with. And paradoxically, um, I got so – the ability to be liked was so good um, – that it was hard for people to give me the kind of critical feedback that I needed uh, to grow and develop. So we have hundreds and thousands of lines of our program that begin to form the way we see ourselves, the world, and others, and we act out of those subconsciously. And until we can begin to see that, 
uh, it's impossible to change it. And be, until I began to see how much I was driven by this need to be liked, where it served me and where it didn't, and that here's the most important point, that I had choice as to whether or not to use that or shape it or, or choose some other belief, um, I was going to be constricted by it. So you had a self-realization that you needed to make change. You were able to see what was happening in your life. How can a person determine if his or her beliefs may be dragging him down? Yes, yeah, so, you know, oftentimes um, people will, the, the, lead, the late leadership expert Warren Bennis called has uh, a, have a crucible moment, some moment in their life that causes them to reflect on who they are and where they're going and what life they want to live. And sometimes that can be very severe, sometimes it can be not so severe, but oftentimes there's something that happens in your life where, you know, you may be living a pretty good life, but there's... Uh, a realization that you want more, that more is possible, um, or something really traumatic happens in your life where you're forced to reconsider almost everything about yourself and uh, how you're living. Um, or it could be just somebody that's really uh, eager uh, to learn and to grow. Um, books have changed my life. It's really uh, one of the main reasons I decided to write this book was that there is an enormous amount of wisdom out there um, that we can avail ourselves of, and oftentimes it's contained in the pages of books. So. I think the most important p thing for, p for listeners to realize is, um, you know, I share this story that the, date, the late uh, author Davis, David Foster Wallace shared, which is, um, you know, two fish are swimming along and an older fish swims by and he says, hey, boys, how's the water? And the two younger fish say, what is water? Mm -hmm. That we're sort of metaphorically swimming through the waters of our beliefs and our culture and our conditioning uh, and we don't even know it. So that realization that we are run by something and that we have the choice to write our own code and really be the author of our lives is probably the most profound uh, moment of awareness anybody can have. I went through very extensive loss at one period in my life, and, and I had that awakening. I mean, it took me 42 years to realize yeah. that my thoughts were not serving me well, the way that I was thinking about myself, about what I could achieve, where I wanted to go. I was self-sabotaging at, at every turn. And once I had that awakening, I knew that I needed to make some changes in my life. So what do you advise our listeners do when they come to the self-realization that something needs to change? How do they begin the process of writing their own code? Yeah, it's a great question, and I love the fact that you said 42 years old. I write in the book that I was almost 40 years old when I woke up to the fact my, that my life was being run by a program written by a seven-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that realization is really powerful. Where to begin is a great question, and, and really the book is designed to be um, a guidebook for where do you begin and what are the key elements of your program that need to be taken on. I argue that there are sort of 10 essential um, parts of your program and therefore 10 lines of code that you can write that will really powerfully reshape your life. Where I usually advise people to, uh, to start, and I work with a lot of very senior business leaders, is what I call survival strategies. And I mentioned one of mine, which was this need to be like. And it turns out that as children, we all have some sort of traumatic experience. And it could be a major trauma or it could be what I call a lowercase t trauma. But something where we felt excluded um, psychologically unsafe, hopefully not physically unsafe, but that may be the case. Um, and those moments tend to really be the more sort of core parts of our program. So I always advise people to take a look and, and see what is your survival strategy, which is what I call these responses to trauma in childhood. And I, there are three types of them. There's a belonging survival strategy, which is the need to be liked, to be accepted, to be included. I already referenced my own example there. There's distancing uh, survival strategies, which is the need to be above it all, to be separate, and those show up as the need to be smart or the need to be right, and we all have parts of all of these, but usually we have one primary one. And then there are controlling survival strategies, which is the need to be in control, the need to win, the need to su succeed. Um, and so I often say, um, look back to your childhood, try to identify a moment in time where you felt unsafe, not included, and I'm, you know, it's virtually certain that in that moment you formed one of these three survival strategies. And just to identify that, because that will be a major and primary driver of your behavior. 
And then there's some steps to go through to begin to master that area of your life. And I'll just say them really quickly. One is, where has it really served you? Because these survival strategies were really designed to protect you. Um, where is it beginning to limit your effectiveness? And I shared where you know, my need to be liked was really doing that. And then what would it look like if I began to expand this need, where I don't have to be run by this need, the survival strategy so much? And what might that give me in terms of range of action and possible results in my life? You coach leaders to achieve their goals. Do you think what many of us do wrong, it's that our thoughts and our beliefs are not in alignment with what we want to achieve? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I have a chapter on identity, and I think maybe one of the most important beliefs we hold is the beliefs we hold about ourselves, what I call your identity. And I ask the readers of the book to do the following exercise, which is to think about what you want most in life. And then think about the types of beliefs you would have to hold about yourself in order to achieve those results. Because I say in the book that the most fundamental driver of human behavior is the desire to be consistent with your identity. It's almost impossible for us to act in ways that are inconsistent with the beliefs that we hold about ourselves. So if I want to do something extraordinary in life, I have to have an extraordinary identity. And here's the really cool thing. Every belief is made up, including the beliefs you hold about yourselves. And if we've made up those beliefs, we can make them up again. We can reconstruct them. And so one of the most powerful things we can do is to begin to get really clear about what do we want in life? I want to be an extraordinary father to my children. Okay, well, what are the beliefs I'm holding about who I am as a father? And what people tend to discover when they go through that process is that the beliefs are not in line with what we really want to achieve because we've been conditioned over the years. I'm not a good math student. You name it, right? The experiences that we've encountered, particularly when we were young, cause us to construct beliefs about ourselves that aren't going to lead to the type of results we want. And those things can be changed. And all of this is happening without us even realizing it. That's exactly right, which is why I called them safety-based subconscious beliefs. They're subconscious, which means they reside below the level of consciousness. I don't even know. It's the fish in the water. I can't even see the water, and they're safety-based. That is, they're primarily designed to keep me safe, not for me to thrive and excel and achieve extraordinary things. Are some people more successful because they are more self-aware? I think so. I think it's sort of the master skill, which is the, you know, I start the book with a quote by a Stoic philosopher named Epictetus. It says, no man is free who is not master of himself. And, and essentially, the book is arguing that you know, there's no guarantee to lead a joyful and fulfilling and extraordinary life. All you can do is to sort of raise the probability of that happening. And I think the biggest driver of doing that is what I would call self-mastery. Because the one thing we can control is our mind. And so what I'm really encouraging readers to do in the book is to take this thing on, this mind that you have, and to know that you have incredible amount of choice. So the one thing that we can control that no one really can take away from us and uh, in my study of human beings and really extraordinary human beings, I tend to see a very direct correlation between people that are successful and however you want to define that and those who really understand themselves, have a degree of self-mastery um, that's way beyond the sort of average person. As you know, the brand that I created about 10 years ago is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, and that was a result of the traumatic loss that I explained earlier, I realized that I needed to get my head in the game. And when I was able to, everything shifted. I meet so many people who live with this victim mentality that everything yeah. happens to them. And, and that's what's so exciting about your work because it really teaches us just how powerful we are. Yeah, and that's a, another really important distinction that you just mentioned, which is this victim mindset that the world happens to me uh, my circumstances shape me. There's very little I can do. It's a psychology term called locus of control. It's been studied for 50 years. And uh, you can either be at the external end of that spectrum, which is the world happens to me, or the internal end of that spectrum, which is there's always something I can do to affect my situation. And the research shows, and I, deta I detailed this research in the book, over 50 years of research, that people that hold an internal locus of control, a responsible mindset, that there's always something I can do to affect a situation, have 
meaningfully better outcomes in every dimension of life, health, finances, career, marriages, education, um, you name it. And uh, unfortunately, the dominant human being sort of mindset is a victim mindset um, that, you know, there's very little I can do to affect my circumstances. And that's probably the most important of the lines of code that you can shift. Is there a daily practice that you can recommend to help our listeners begin this process? Yeah, I I love that question because um, daily practices, I think, in and of themselves are the act of extraordinary people. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, very short stories is is Jerry Seinfeld, when he was beginning his career as a comedian, said, I'm going to write a joke every single day, and I'm never going to, good or bad, and I'm never going to miss a day. I'm never going to break the chain. So one of the things I always advise people is take on a daily practice and never break the chain. The act of doing something every day without fail, uh, without negotiating with yourself, is the act of an extraordinary person. So just doing that alone, I say take 10 minutes, wake up 10 minutes before you otherwise would, and never miss a day. That will begin to transform you. What you do in it, less important. What I do um, is I make sure that... um, I have a a gratitude practice. I reflect on the three things that I really want to accomplish in the day. Um, I I sort of remind myself of my values uh, and how am I going to live in accordance with my values. And I think really importantly is I say my identity. So I have an identity statement. We just talked about that a few minutes ago. And that identity statement will lead to certain behaviors, but only if I'm continually reminding myself of it. So every morning, one of the first things I do is I say my identity statement, and that's my daily practice of ensuring that I'm wiring that set of beliefs into my mind um, so that I'll act out of them you know, more consistently. The book is Master Your Code, The Art, Wisdom, and Science of Leading an Extraordinary Life. If you'd like to get more information about Darren and his work, you can visit darrenjgold.com, or as always, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the site, listen to past shows on demand, read our digital magazine, and be sure to sign up for our mailing list. Darren, in our final moments, what's the takeaway? What would you like to leave our listeners with? Um, I take a hard stand in the book that everybody has the potential uh, and the right to lead an extraordinary life. And I leave that up to you know your listeners to define what that means. I don't think there's any one definition Uh, The invitation is to take yourself on. Uh, That can be a little frightening for some and challenging, and and I get it. But the rewards of that path, the looking inward, the understanding of what's driving you, and then the exercise of choice to begin to really author the beliefs and values and rules that you hold um, are really extraordinary. And uh, I hope the book can be a part of that journey for you. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. Darren, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.